Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Uh, so last week I presented a build for a Graviturgist wizard. Uh, this is a build that I called the Tactical Blaster. And the idea of the build is we're going to mix uh, the ability to move creatures or inhibit their movement as well as blasting them for damage. So in today's video what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about how we best make use of this kind of character because if we don't do the strategy right, uh, what it's going to end up being is it's going to end up being a blaster that just does less damage than other blasters. We don't want that. The whole idea of this character is that because we can manipulate the movement of the enemies, because we can in inhibit the movement of the enemies, that is going to give us a tactical advantage in combat. But it's only going to give us a tactical advantage if we play it right. So in today's video, what I want to do is go over the basic strategies for that, talk about some of the spells that work, talk about some of the ways we can work with other party members to be even more effective. But before we get into it, I want to thank some of my patrons who are helping me to support this channel. These are some Archmage level patrons and a new benefit for Archmage level subscribers is there's going to be a one shot I'm going to be running every month that only my Archmage patrons can join in on. Today I want to thank Geek Dice, Ben Potts, TUM and Bob Raymond in particular for their support. Thank you guys so much for your support and thank you to all my patrons of all levels. My patrons help me build this channel. So with that out of the way, let's get started. So the first thing we need to know when we're talking about a Graviturgist wizard, there are two parts to making the strategy with them successful. The first is the hazard, and then the second is the manipulation. Now the hazard is what we need to set up first, and this can be any number of effects, either created by us or by allied party members. But the idea behind a hazard is it's going to be the area the enemy doesn't want to be in. Maybe it does damage to them, maybe it inhibits their movement, maybe it restrains them, or maybe it does multiple numbers of those things. One way or the other, the hazard is where they don't want to be. And the reason we want to set up the hazard first is so that when we start blasting them, moving them, inhibiting their movement, we can do that with the thoughts of making sure they either stay in the hazard, or if they're outside the hazard, that they're pulled into it. So what I've got here is kind of a hypothetical encounter. We've got our Graviturgist wizard. They're right there. Uh, then maybe we have a paladin. And then maybe we have like a melee cleric. And in this case, we're going to say there's a couple drow. It could be anything. It doesn't matter what the enemies are. Uh, I'm just going to use drow in this case as a hypothetical. So let's say at this point, we're pretty low level. Maybe we're second level. So on my wizard's turn, I'm going to cast a Grease spell. This Grease spell is actually going to catch both of these drow. Uh, so what's going to happen is, immediately they're going to make dexterity saves. If they fail those dexterity saves, they fall prone. So this is now the hazard. We are now ready to start manipulating movement. Uh, and we've already started to manipulate movement because, of course, if they fall prone, they have to get back up, that takes half their movement, and the grease area itself is considered difficult terrain, so that halves movement as well. But just by casting the grease spell, we can already help our allies, because if this drow is fallen prone, or even if this drow is fallen prone, our allies are going to be able to get to them and attack with advantage. But usually what happens with the grease spell is once an enemy gets up and gets out of the effect, then that's the end of that effect for them, and once both enemies have gone out of the effect, we wouldn't expect the Grease to have much more impact on combat. But because we've made our wizard specifically for the purpose of both blasting and moving enemies, we can keep this Grease as an effective spell. Uh, because at second level, we're going to have the Thorn Whip spell. So maybe we're going to move 5, 10, 15, 20, and then we can cast a Thorn Whip at this guy right here. And if we hit, we're going to do damage to him, and then we can pull him up to 10 feet towards us. So maybe we pull him 5 feet towards us, and as soon as he enters the Grease Spell, he has to make another Dexterity Saving Throw. If he fails that Dexterity Saving Throw, he falls prone, and once again my allies are going to have advantage to attack him. And because the Grease Spell doesn't require concentration, because my Thorn Whip doesn't require concentration, I can do this on a round-by-round -round basis. And because a creature that gets up from prone will probably only have 15 feet of movement left. 
it is unlikely they're going to get far out of that range. So there's a really good chance that even if they escape it again, we might be able to pull them in again, and then they may fall prone again, and we're going to get more and more uses out of that grease than most wizards would. But when we're talking about working with other party members, the most effective way they can help us is to set up the hazard for us. Because although our spells tend to concentrate on blasting and moving enemies, the idea of the hazard kind of spells, the spells where enemies don't want to be, this is not unique to wizards, it's not unique to gravitergists. There are all kinds of spells that all kinds of classes can get that can set up the hazard. In this particular case, we've added a druid to our mix. And that druid has cast a moonbeam on the drow. We have an area where the drow don't want to be. Now a moonbeam isn't going to affect their movement. Instead, what it's going to do is damage. At the beginning of their turn, they're going to take 2d10 radiant damage, half if they make a saving throw, and then they're almost certainly going to want to get out of that moonbeam right away. Now, the druid would normally require their action to move that moonbeam. But let's say our Graviturgist wizard is still on their first turn. They haven't done anything yet. Well, maybe they're going to cast a misty step. Head over here, pull this guy in with a thorn whip, then maybe our druid is going to move down here and maybe pull this guy in with a thorn whip. And as soon as they enter the area on a turn, they're going to take another 2d10 points of damage. And then once they begin their turn within the area, they will take another 2d10 points of damage. So we may get far more damage from that moonbeam by pulling enemies into it than by moving that moonbeam over them. Because if we put the moonbeam over them, they're going to take 2d10 damage at the beginning of their turn. But if we pull them into the effect, they're going to take 2d10 damage when they enter the effect for the first time and 2d10 damage at the beginning of their turn. So they will take twice as much damage. So this ends up being twice as effective as simply moving the moonbeam to try to encompass our enemies. Another hazard spell that druids get that's really effective is plant growth. Now, plant growth isn't usable in every terrain, but wherever it is applicable, plant growth is really effective because plant growth lasts forever and it doesn't require concentration. And what it does is every square of movement that an enemy wants to get through plant growth requires four squares of movement. So it requires 20 feet of movement to move a five foot square. So if we consider that our druid is maybe cast plant growth and the edge of it is this green squiggly line right here. If I cast something like a pulse wave, which I've represented with this cone right here, on these drow, I could potentially push them both back 15 feet into the plant growth. And then if I am six level or higher, I could push them an additional five feet into the plant growth and they're going to have a really hard time getting out. This is 20 feet of movement. This is 40 feet of movement. In order to get out of this effect, this drow would definitely have to dash. And this drow, 20, 40, 60, even with a dash, wouldn't be able to get out of the effect. And then I could potentially hit them with another pulse wave and send them right back tumbling in again. And speaking of great hazard spells, our cleric eventually is going to get spirit guardians, likely right at fifth level. Once they get spirit guardians, spirit guardians makes a fantastic hazard spell. Spirit Guardians doesn't just do damage to everyone who enters the area for the first time, as well as damage at the beginning of their turn, but it also halves their movement rate. So if these drow were able to escape this effect, a simple move with a pulse wave to send them right back in would have them take damage as they enter the effect, as well as at the beginning of their turn. Also, if you hit them with something like a Sapping Sting Cantrip, uh, if you want to save some spell slots, Knocking them prone is going to make it very hard for them to get out because getting up from prone is going to take half their movement. They're going to have 15 feet of movement left, but they have half movement rate. So moving even five feet would require all their movement. And if they want to dash, then they're not going to be able to disengage and they're going to provoke attacks of opportunity. And even then, they're barely going to escape the effect, at which point you could do something like a thorn whip and pull them right back in again. And once again, they would take damage right away when they enter the effect and again at the beginning of their turn. Once again, we're increasing the effect of the Spirit Guardian significantly. We're making it hard for enemies to get out of it. We're causing effects that have them take the damage more than once in a round. Uh, and these are things we normally can't do with the Spirit Guardians. So because we have a Graviturgist Wizard in the party, this spell becomes more effective than ever. Now I'm changing our perspective a bit. Now we're talking about looking at this uh, from the side. So the blue line represents the ground. Uh, now one spell that works incredibly well with the Graviturgist Wizard is the spell Spike Growth. 
Spike Growth is available to Druids, Rangers, and Nature Domain Clerics. And what happens with Spike Growth is not just do they take damage when they enter the effect, but every five feet of movement through the effect causes more damage. And there's no save. It's 2d4 points of damage every five feet of movement within the effect. So if we are to hit these creatures with something like a pulse wave, they're going to take several squares worth of damage. And because we have gravity well, we could probably even push them an additional five, or even just pull them back another five so that they're closer to the edge and easier for us to get at. One way or the other, the more movement back and forth in that area, the more damage they're going to take. And I've talked a little bit about how other classes can help us set up the hazards, but I also want to talk about how other classes can help us with our pushing and pulling effects. So let's say one of our party members is a warlock. Well, that warlock might want to consider invocations like Repelling Blast or Grasp of Fadar. If this warlock was to hit this drow here with a Repelling Blast, it's going to send them 10 feet back, and they're going to take the damage from the Eldritch Blast and from 10 feet of movement in the Spike Growth. Then if they have Grasp of Fadar as well, then they can pull them back another 10 feet, and they're going to take another 44 points of damage from the Spike Growth. Now, if they have multiple Eldritch Blasts, they could do it again potentially causing four, even six or eight squares of movement through the spike growth. Now, one of the spells that I mentioned was really good for a Graviturgist wizard was Fly. Uh, now, if we cast Fly, then if we are doing the Hazard spell, we're limited to spells that don't require concentration. And we don't have a lot of options. We have Grease and we have Transmute Rock. Uh, so hopefully another party member can help us with the Hazards if we're casting the Fly spell. But I did want to mention how the Fly spell was really good. So let's say for a moment this brown area represents a transmute rock. Uh, so if we have the fly spell on our Graviturgist wizard, what we could do is we can fly over that area and then we can throw a thorn whip at one of these enemies. Now if we throw it at this enemy right here, if we hit the enemy they take damage from the thorn whip and then they are moved up to 10 feet towards us. Then because we have gravity well we can move them another 10 feet. Then what's going to happen is they're going to fall. And because they're falling more than 10 feet, they're going to take 1d6 points of damage, and they're going to fall prone. Then because they've fallen prone, in order to get up, they have to use half their movement rate. So half their movement rate, in this case, would be 15 feet, leaving them with 15 feet left of movement. The problem is, is that Transmute Rock requires 4 feet for every 1 feet of movement. So to move 1 square, or 5 feet, requires 20 feet of movement. This drow doesn't have 20 feet of movement left. So in order to move at all, this drow is forced to dash. And even if it dashes, it's barely going to get out of the effect, at which point we could cast another Thorn Whip and put it right back in the same place. This can also be incredibly effective in, if instead of this Transmute Rock, it's something like an Everts Black Tentacles, because Everts Black Tentacles doesn't just slow your movement, it restrains you. However, if we are flying, we are not casting the Evers Black Tentacles, somebody else would have to. Now hopefully that example has you starting to think three-dimensionally, because I do think you want to think three-dimensionally if we're talking about casting spells using a Gravitrogis Wizard. Uh, so let me give you another example. Let's say we are concentrating on a Black Tentacles, and you can see by my fantastic artwork these Black Tentacles right here. Now if these draw were originally in this effect, and they've pulled out of it now, now they're a danger to us. That's when we want to think of spells like Gravity Sinkhole. So Gravity Sinkhole I've centered right here, and this green area represents the area of effect. So we can collect both these drow in the area of effect of this Gravity Sinkhole. Now they're going to have to make saving throws, and if they fail, they're going to take 5d10 points of damage, and they're going to be pulled to the center of the sinkhole. Now this one here will get pulled to the center of the sinkhole, and then it's going to fall, and it's going to fall 20 feet, and land in the Evers Black Tentacles. Once it does so, now it's going to have to make a saving throw where it's going to take damage from the Black Tentacles and get restrained. And then at the beginning of its turn, it's going to take damage again, and it's going to have to try to use its action to get out. Now this one can't quite get to the middle because presumably this one's already in the middle at that time. So that's when we would use our gravity well in order to pull this guy beside the other guy so that he too falls into the Black Tentacles and same thing happens to him. And this could happen to many drow, and it could happen to drow on the other side of the effect as well. Furthermore, drow that are already in the Black Tentacles would be pulled up, take the damage, fall, 
fall prone, take the damage again, have to save again, and potentially become restrained again. So if we think three-dimensionally, new options open up for a gravitagious wizard that are incredibly effective. But once again, we want to get our allies to help us out here because this is a lot of setup. We've got to cast black tentacles. Then we've got to cast our gravity sinkhole. Uh, some combats only last a couple rounds. Ideally, what we want is somebody else to set up that hazard so that we can start blasting our creatures in that hazard and having them take a lot more damage and become disabled. And remember, these creatures, because they've fallen and they've fallen prone, even if they escape being restrained using their action, now they're going to have to use half their movement to get back up, and they're in difficult terrain. I'd like to give one more example. Now we're going to get into high level, to the point where a Graviturgist has their 14th level ability called Event Horizon. Now what Event Horizon does is, as an action, you magically emit a powerful field of gravitational energy that tugs other creatures for up to one minute or until your concentration ends. For the duration, whenever a creature hostile to you starts its turn within 30 feet of you, it must make a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, it takes 2d10 force damage and its speed is reduced to zero until the start of its next turn. But here's the important part. On a successful save, it takes half as much damage and every foot it moves this turn costs two extra feet of movement. So just to be clear, that means to move one five foot square, it has to use 15 feet of movement. So let's go back to our cleric with our spirit guardians. Now I've talked about clerics before in other videos and my recommendation for clerics as they get higher level spell slots is to upcast spirit guardians because spirit guardians is a great spell for upcasting. But if you have a gravitagious wizard in your party, it becomes doubly effective uh, because once that gravitagious wizard has event horizon, we can completely disable enemies. So in this case, let's say we have our drow and our cleric has just moved into range and cast the spirit guardians. Then on our turn, our gravitatis wizard begins their event horizon. So at the beginning of each of these drow's turns, they're going to take damage from the spirit guardians and from the event horizon. Now they're going to make a saving throw against the event horizon. If they make that saving throw, they're not immobilized. If they are immobilized, they're done. They just stay there for another round. They're going to take the damage from both effects again, and again, and again, and again, until they make their save. But what happens when they make their save? Well, if this drow wants to get to the party, they have two problems that have stacked upon each other. Number one, Spirit Guardians halves the movement of enemies within the area. And number two, Event Horizon, even if they make their saving throw, every foot of movement requires an additional two feet. So in order to move to this square right here, that drow has to spend 15 feet of movement and its movement speed is halved. So it just moved its entire movement speed to move one square. And that's after it made its saving throw. If it dashed, it could potentially get up to us. And that's as close as it could get. And even if both did that on their turn, the cleric could just disengage because the cleric doesn't need an action to maintain their spirit guardians and put them right back where they were. And then we could just move and put them right back where they were in comparison to us again. And they're in the same boat, and they're going to continue to take damage. They're going to be able to do nothing unless they have ranged attacks. Now, creatures that have ranged attacks have a way out of this, but a lot of big creatures, a lot of tough creatures, don't have an effective ranged attack. And any creature that doesn't have an effective ranged attack and doesn't have a teleport effect is totally screwed, whether they make their saves or not. So even if they have something like legendary resistance, it's not really going to help them. So I just want to go through a number of spells that are effective to use as hazards. Uh, and again, there is no reason why we have to create the hazard. We're no better at creating hazard spells than any other class in the game. Uh, but these are some options for us and for the rest of our party. The first, at first level, I would talk about Grease. Grease is a small area of effect, fairly minor effect, but it doesn't use concentration. Second level, then we have web. Web is a good way to create the restraint condition in enemies, so it is a reasonable hazard effect. Uh, if we are a druid, moonbeam is also a really good effect, especially if we can make use of pushing creatures in over and over again. Spike growth, also a really good effect. This is second level for druids, for rangers, and every square of movement through a spike growth 
is going to do additional damage. So this one works really well when we can have multiple ways to move our enemies. At third level, our clerics are going to get Spirit Guardians, and Spirit Guardians is a third level spell. It's also a great fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh level spell if we upcast it. And it is always going to be a great hazard spell because it does good damage. It does damage to any creature as soon as they enter the effect, and it has movement rate. So it is going to marry very nicely with the kinds of things we can do. Another third level spell that's really good is Plant Growth. Plant Growth is a druid spell, and Plant Growth severely slows the movement of enemies. There's no saving throw for it, and it doesn't require concentration. Another spell at third level that is good to use as a hazard is Sleet Storm. Sleet Storm severely limits movement. It also can cause the prone condition. And when we get creatures caught in a Sleet Storm, hitting them with effects like Magnify Gravity that also half their movement and do damage will make creatures that finally get out of there very soft. Once we get to 4th level spells, Eaver's Black Tentacles makes a great hazard spell. Sickening Radiance, which does exhaustion, can be a fantastic hazard spell. Control Water or Maelstrom can be very effective spells as well if we are in a watery environment. Once we get to 5th level spells, Transmute Rock is a great way to not use concentration, create a hazard that does not provide a saving throw. A couple other spells that are reasonably good are Wall of Fire with 4th level spells or Insect Plague with 5th level spells. So those are some basics. I just wanted to give a visual representation of what I was talking about in those build videos so that when you use your Graviturgist Wizard, you understand that we're setting up the hazard first, then we're going to use our movement spells in order to do damage and move enemies into a hazard. And that is going to combine the damage from that blast with the effect of the hazard, so doubling the effect of those spells. And that is how we're going to make sure our Graviturgist isn't just a crappy blaster. So I hope that's useful to you. Otherwise, I'm going to be back next week. And until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. And I'll talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.